John is going to join us on stage here just to make some closing remarks. Okay, um, I, um, I think I have about 10 minutes to close. So, uh, and, um, I thought I would just um, say a little bit about the, the perennial and wonderful issue of our identity and then maybe something about the, the kind of uh, thorny but equally uh, wonderful issue of our size and then maybe close with uh, a word about our, our, our virtue. Um, and um, with the identity issue, I wanted to start with Hutchins, who was uh, you know, one of our more famous presidents. People like to quote Hutchins, uh, and, and, and he liked to be quoted, too, so it was kind of worked both ways. And um, Hutchins once observed that, uh, quote, the greatest obstacle to the development of a university in this country is the popular misconception of what a university is. The two most popular misconceptions are that it is a kindergarten and that it is a country club. Uh, and, of course, what Hutchins was saying is that we are neither a, a kindergarten or a country club. Uh, that was kind of Yale, where he, he, and he would make all kinds of ins insulting comments about Yale. Apologies to the Yale alums in the room. And, um, and uh, in a way, uh, what I'm suggesting is you know, this is a place that we all love. And I, and I have to say that the, both panels are so, so inc incredibly impressive because of the quality of the people who are have run, uh, who, who are running and who, who will in the future run this place. It's uh, the uh, folks in the room, the alums, parents, I, I, it's, it's in pretty good hands when you have folks like this running the place. Um, and, uh, um, but everybody likes to, uh, it, it, I think Don suggested this, you know, it's, it's a, it, there's a kind of a conceit, it's a special place, it's a unique place, and we, we love to really uh, talk about how unique we are. And in some ways, Hutchins was perfect at that because he, um, he, he was kind of the master of our uniqueness. And um, so we're not a kindergarten and we're not a country club. So what are we? You know, you could, the life of the mind, the fellowship of, of reason and so forth. Um, but I was thinking about that because, you know, it's kind of hard to imagine Chicago as a kindergarten. But, of course, we do have scaff hunt um, where you have kids hanging out of windows. Uh, their parents don't know this is happening. Um, defying the laws of gravity. And then those same kids, after they have not fallen outside the windows, are creating uh, nuclear reactors without the approval of the Atomic Energy Commission, um, um, probably violating federal law. And um, so maybe that we're not a kindergarten, but you might say we engage in forms of what one might call adult kinder, um, kindergartenitis. Uh, and um, there's a kind of a carnivalesque quality to the place, and it's, um, it's student culture that is not kindergarten-like, but it's certainly highly playful, occasionally uh, deeply irreverent, and sometimes Ill Ill violating the criminal laws of the state of Illinois. Uh, okay, so that's the kindergarten. Uh, for the country club, now, uh, we don't, uh, uh, we're, we're not a kind of swanky place, okay? Uh, we've built good and sturdy buildings. Um, but I do remember a story that I once met a prospective student whose parent, uh, father told me that this young man was a really talented kid and was, um, had been admitted to Chicago and a couple of other top schools in the Ivy Plus. Um, and he was on the, um, the, the kind of couldn't make up his mind because um, he was a golfer and um, he, he really wanted um, to come to a place that had a naturally, nationally competitive golf course. That, that, that's called a country club, okay? And um, so I said, uh, and the father wanted the boy to come here, so I said, okay, well, uh, maybe we can do something. So we got a picture of a, of a, of a wonderful place called the Jackson Park Golf Course over on, um, uh, and it, if you go there at dusk on a beautiful summer's day and with a certain camera angle, um, <laughs> you can um, take a picture. Of this. It's, not, it's, it's not a fake picture. It's, um, and so I actually um, did, we did this. I had somebody do it, and we mailed this to the kid. And... Um, he accepted our offer of admission and came to Chicago. Now, he later um, found me out uh, once he had visited uh, Jackson Park, and um, he kind of berated me because I had tricked him. Uh, and I said, young man, no, I didn't trick you. I, I, I didn't offer you a country club. I offered you a public golf course. And, um, and uh, uh, he just kind of despaired of that. So he, he quickly then switched from golf, which is, as you all know, involves hitting little balls around uh, the grass. Uh, uh, to debate, um, he became a formidable debater. Instead of uh, hitting little balls, he was hitting uh, his opponents with a barrage of words, many of which he learned in the core curriculum. Uh, so m my point is that Hutchins was right about what we're not, 
but it turns out that on some occasions, modest compromises can do wonders to move history forward. And, uh, 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 or, or to put differently, that uh, our identity is actually both one and, uh, and many, it's malleable, and um, it's changeable, and I think one of the ways we've been able to protect the, the, the kind of venerable uh, fellowship of reason is that uh, uh, there, there are many different ways to reason, and many different kinds of people can reason, we can reason together, but that the, over time, the, uh, we, I think we would be, uh, miss so many opportunities if we were not flexible in the way we took pride in that identity, all the while trying to protect that identity, and I think one of the great things that uh, my colleagues have managed to do over the last 30 years is to do both simultaneously. Um, so that's the issue of identity. It's, it's a wonderful thing to have uh, uh, once you take it seriously, but not so seriously that you can't go golfing and can't uh, hang out of windows uh, uh, with, uh, or in nuclear reactors. Um, the issue of the size, uh, uh, you know, this was a really hot button issue. And, and, and I have to say, uh, Jeff Stone uh, and, 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 and our Friend, our, 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 our much revered colleague uh, Hugo Sonnenschein, who's no, lo no longer with us, um, we thought a great deal about this issue in the 19, uh, 1990s, precisely because of the the something that Mark mentioned. That is to say, you know, when I started as dean, I, I noticed that we didn't have many uh, um, children of our own alumni coming to the place, and um, and I would ask alums, you know, this and that uh, again. I, just to quote Mark, I would hear, you know, I got a great education, comma, but I don't want to put my kid through that. And then I would have all these interesting, like, what, what was that? And it had very little to do with the, um, the kind of quality of the intellectual experience, but it just had to do with a kind of relentless um, sense of, a kind of grim sense. I, I, I understand our distinguished current president, Paul Alvisotis, was here during that era, so I have to, because when you're talking to alums, you have to be like, what, what year did you go to the school here before? <laughs> Before I say what I'm about to say, um, but um, still, uh, uh, I don't want to put my kid through that. And, and so, the, in a way, what, what we began in the '90s was an attempt to try to change the that into something that would, you know, would be productive and helpful to the university as a whole. This issue of the, of the size was quite interesting because, as Jeff will remember, you know, we, we were told that um, we had this very small college and we were going to try to make it bigger and get really messed up. Uh, we, Admit a bunch of uh, dummy dummies who you know bring disgrace to themselves and discredit to everybody else. <laughs> it turned out that uh, this was a, a flaw in the statistical calculations of our, our the folks making that argument because most people didn't realize before World War II, uh, half of the undergraduate population was counted as members of the divisions, not the college. And so, if you recalculated it, actually we have at a very large college before 1940 larger than Princeton, larger than uh, Stanford, about the same size as, uh, uh, as Harvard. And it was only after World War II that the whole thing collapsed for reasons that were you know, alluded to, uh, mis really profound miscalculations on Hush's part. And, and so that the, it wasn't that we were trying to kind of you know, abolish the, or, or undo a small college, we were trying to bring back what was really a, quite a successful college before World War II. Uh, and that if the mistakes that were made, and I, and I think they were genuinely and well intended, but disastrous mistakes in the 50s, uh, which Kimpton then talked about quite candidly, if they had not been made, we, we would have ended up with a college of our current size of about 7,000 students. We would have had that 30 years ago. And, and as, as Jeff and I often talked about, you know, these are, what, what this meant is that we had tens of thousands of missing alumni. They're, they're missing. They, they, they didn't die. They never existed because they didn't come here. And the ones that many, because it did have come here, many of them dropped out. And so that the, this issue of size became very important. Uh, I think it's, it was a hugely controversial issue, but I think it was the right decision to do. And the fact we supported it, um, because I think it involved the broader welfare of the university. And I think today, the, the fact that we have 7,000 really bright, enthusiastic students with a 99% retention rate is a, a real tribute to all of the faculty sitting in this room and all the people who came before you and, and, and I, and we need to con continue to protect that. Um, <clears throat> finally, virtue, uh, you, you know, the, um, uh, and I think this comes back to a, a point that Jeff made at the end about free expression. Um, one of the reasons I think we've been able to sustain um, free expression um, is, um, is the quality of the student body. Uh, when I was doing the research on the, uh, for this little monograph I wrote on free expression, um, uh, you know, there were, there were these, these big kind of pre-Red Scare uh, events like the Walgreen Affair and then the Red Scare events, the Broyles Affair in the 50s. 
And when um, Hutchins, and this, Hutchins was a real champion of free expression, um, all of our presidents have uh, been so, but Hutchins, in a sense, began that. What struck me was not that he would defend free expression or that the faculty would defend free expression. I, I have to say that many of the board of trustees were rather uncertain about, you know, what is this? And, uh, but in the end, they strongly supported it as well. But what struck me was how strongly the undergraduates defended the idea of free expression and economic freedom, both the, not only for their own interests, but for the university's interests. Th this kind of a student culture did not just come about uh, because Hutchins wished it so. It came about because of the work of the Corps in the 30s, and I mentioned this yesterday, uh, the men and the women who created the Corps in the 1930s were not simply creating a new curriculum or a new way of education. They were trying to create a new student culture, and a more academically oriented student culture, people who would take the ideas seriously, who would take their education seriously, would take the project of the university as a fellowship of reason seriously. And we, we are blessed with, the, with that kind of student culture today. I think we've strengthened it. We've undone some of the damage that was done in the 50s for other reasons. But we should never take that for granted because it's so rare to have a student culture that is so closely aligned with the faculty culture. And this does not just happen. It happened because men and women in the 30s and 40s worked to have it happen. And one of our responsibilities is, is to protect that, that unity of, 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 um, of the university um, we find today. Harper's vision of the place was it was supposed to be one university. There, and this rhetoric of oneness goes through the, um, the history of the university. Again, it's something you can say. It's like you know, pronouncements you could put on the wall where one university. It doesn't mean anything if you don't have a student culture that shares the values of the faculty culture. And so much of, the, um, of our culture relies upon this, uh, the work that we do with undergraduates and assimilating and, 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 and making them, helping them to understand what it means to go to a, a great university as opposed to a high school or or, or a place that, uh, where people are afraid to talk and, and, and want to make them afraid to talk and to defend their own ideas. So I, I just wanted to say, um, in, uh, in conclusion, that the, um, it's, um, the, the work of the last 30 years or the lack, work of the last 50 years has had many different champions. Uh, I mentioned, uh, and I've been grateful that Hannah Gray was here yesterday and Don Randall is here today, Paul Olive Sotis, these are all great presidents. Uh, I mentioned Hugo Sonnenschein, he, he was a truly great president and is no longer with us. Uh, one, one other leader I do want to mention is Bob Zimmer, who is, uh, uh, who is with us but not, he's in the city, he can't be here today. And, and, and the work that, uh, that Bob did over the last 15 years in, um, in defending all of these values, free expression and supporting the expansion of the college and the transformation of the college and defending all of the other things has been extraordinary. And I think. Uh, uh, the university has always depended upon strong leadership of this president, so we've been blessed by having a series of very strong and enlightened leaders, and Bob certainly was, a, was among them. And, and uh, uh, without his support, uh, including his, uh, uh, for better or worse, uh, deciding to reappoint me for, for endless months of uh, term. <laughs> I mean, I had to get reelected. The faculty had to agree to all of this, but, but he could have said no. Uh, Without his support, uh, very, very little of this would have, would have come about. So thank you for your friendship. And um, it, it is a very great place. It's a, 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 it is a unique place, uh, uh, as long as we don't take that altogether seriously uh, uh, and, and, and uh, talk ourselves into myths like that we're the, you know, we don't have to worry about student dropouts because they're all self-selected. I mean, talk about talking yourselves into a myth that was so destructive. Um, and um, and um, and it, it is a place that uh, is, is worth protecting, and I think uh, uh, we should celebrate the collective work of, of so many faculty, uh, so many faculty, and, and as I look around the room, um, in doing so. Now, I want to say one final thing, and that's uh, my colleague Jim uh, Chandler. Uh, uh, he did, you'll notice, uh, offer a provocative comment, uh, and uh, uh, this kind of dis disputational comment about uh, you might take that to be a challenge to our study abroad model. Okay. So I have to, uh, no, he's shaking his head, no, but uh, uh, let, let, let's play with this. So, uh, uh, so uh, is, is study abroad rigorous? Now, when we started the programs, uh, many of you will know, and I see Robert Morris, uh, I was accused of starting uh, Club Ed Abroad, okay? And, um, and one prominent faculty member uh, was particularly uh, disturbed about this. I remember he said, uh, you know, uh, this is really bad. You, you, you're going to ruin the University of Chicago. And I said, well, if it's so bad, like, why don't you go do it too? Because then you can really get the goods on me. And, um, and so he, he went off and um, uh, taught in a, a, a European city, let's put it that way, 
uh, in one of our sub. And, and when he came back, uh, he was avoiding me. Uh, he, uh, he was kind of like, uh, he'd see me coming down the hall and he'd go the other way. And I, so I finally, I said, look, uh, uh, how's it going? I, he said, uh, come on, tell me. He says, uh, uh, I was wrong. Uh, uh, it was a great experience. Can I go back again? Uh, and I said, well, uh, two things. Uh, first of all, you've got to get in line. And secondly, you have to stop bad-mouthing our programs. And, and uh, as the Emperor Franz used to say in... Um, in the Asperger Empire, the emperor was told once that so-and-so was a patriot, and he said, yes, but is he a patriot for me? And, uh, and, uh, and I, I said, I, I need you to become a patriot for, uh, uh, for a study abroad. So, but, but to come to Jim's point, uh, you know, one of the things we do in, when I teach in Vienna is we read the Communist Manifesto, which is a great book. A, well, it is a book that some people deem great, other people deem pernicious. Uh, and, uh, but the very few people in America uh, would, I think, you know, it's a kind of a historical text. It turns out there are people in Vienna, as in many other European cities, who are still living and breathing Marxists. And uh, one of the things I do is I, we read the, and I take I have some friends in the Austrian parliament and the Socialist Party who actually believe in Marx and have them meet uh, uh, the, these folks. And I, I took the kids over to have coffee with the deputy leader of the Socialist Party who gave them an hour lecture on Marx and the applicability of Marx to current housing policy in the city of Vienna, because they have running. And the kids came away and said, Professor Boyer, that guy really believes this stuff. I said, I said, I said, I said, I said. no, that was a learning moment. Uh, and, um, and so they had read Marx. They had, um, they had, uh, I took them out for a tort and some uh, great whipped cream out later. Um, but they had learned something they couldn't possibly learn in Cobb Hall. So I, I think that's rigor is additive. It's not subtractive. Uh, and with that great. Uh, uh, insight, I, I, I invite you all to, to launch. So th thank you very much. Well, that really is our closing. Not much more should be said after that. Thank you all for joining us this morning to celebrate John and his um, tremendous commitment and impact here at the university and on thousands of lives of, of young scholars and all of us um, and many others in our community. So thank you all. Have a wonderful afternoon.